Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to chat with us yeah. today. We really no appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, uh, Howie Hawkins, the presumptive Green Party nominee. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm leading. I wouldn't call myself presumptive yet. That's uh, okay. Good, good call. Well, that's something that we would actually uh, like to chat with you about. Uh, what's uh, uh, how is that? How is that going? You say you're the the leading, not the presumptive. Um, are there other members in the field that uh, that you see as potentially uh, taking the nomination? I think I got a pretty good lead, and I expect to win. But you say presumptive before you actually have the delegates and. Then people say, oh, who does he think he is? And they'll vote for the other people just to keep it going. Sure, yeah. No, it's I'm leading, and I'll be presumptive when I've got a majority of delegates committed to me. Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, uh, assuming that you maintain that lead and end up uh, taking the nomination, uh, what would make your candidacy so special is uh, the alternative it would provide to the, you know, the two-party duopoly we found ourselves in as a, as a country and with our politics. And... Um, I was reading your websites and your campaigns about page. Uh, something that uh, really stuck out to me was a quote where I read, repelled by the racism and warmongering that uh, you saw in both of the major parties, you kind of asked yourself, where's my party? And uh, that's how a lot of us lefties are feeling right now. Um, you know, following the implosion of the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, a lot of us that were more excited and, uh, you know, hoping to take the Democratic Party in a more progressive direction are, are, have just been so defeated that we've ended up with uh, Joe Biden, who's, you know, kind of the opposite of the exciting or progressive leader that we saw in uh, Senator Sanders. Do you have anything to say to those voters? Yeah, if you were supporting Bernie Sanders because you wanted Medicare for all, yeah. you wanted a Green New Deal, you wanted an economic bill of rights, you wanted student and medical debt relief, you know, if you want to keep fighting for those things, don't support Joe Biden. He's not for those things. Our campaign is. And if you get behind Joe Biden and settle for him as the lesser evil, you get lost in the sauce. You know, people don't know that you're a progressive or a socialist. You're supporting Biden, who doesn't support what you do. Everybody knows what the green vote stands for, so don't waste your vote. And if you're going to put energy into the election, put it into a campaign that's for what you're fighting for. If you don't vote for what you want, you're never going to get it. Yeah, you've been very open in your uh, criticisms of America's capitalist system, and your platform calls for an economic model of eco-socialism. Uh, for people who are unfamiliar with that term, could you kind of tell them what it stands for and how it might differ from the democratic socialism that's been popularized by someone like Senator Sanders? Well, it's, it's a democratic socialism. We say eco-socialism because we want to produce enough for everybody to have their basic needs met but do it within ecological limits. You know, socialism in the 20th century was about increasing the forces of production. So we had enough overcoming the problem of poverty. That problem has been solved for a while. We're very productive. Now it's a question of how do we have a system where we produce what people need in a way that is ecologically sustainable. And you can't do that when you have corporations competing in the market for profit they try to externalize costs onto society and the environment, and they compete to grow, and you got to grow or die in the market. So you have a system that's like cancer on the biosphere. It grows without any sense of balance or reciprocity with the environment. So we need a socialist economic democracy where in the major sectors, the major means of production are socially owned and democratically administered. So when it comes to choosing technology, it's not in the hands of the Exxons and the mobiles or the Westinghouses and the GEs in terms of nuclear power, or the state, because we chose nuclear power over solar power after the Paley Commission, which Truman set up to deal with the possibility of not enough oil in the Eisenhower administration received. They recommended we go solar, but the Eisenhower administration said we're going nuclear. And that was not done by the market. It wasn't done by democracy. It was done by the military industrial complex. So we need a democratic economy in order to make choices that are ecologically rational, as well as uh, advance the interests of the majority of people. So, you know, that's what socialism is about, economic democracy. And ecological socialism is about recognizing that we have to produce what we need in a way that's ecologically sustainable. And that's different than the emphasis of socialism in the 20th century. So in the 21st century, we're talking about ecological socialism. Interesting. And uh, on the same page, 
uh, your candidacy has uh, branded you as the, the original Green New Dealer, kind of trying to capitalize or, or uh, harken back to the policies that have been uh, really hot lately, um, you know, promoted by people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Sanders himself. Um, with all this talk about green energy recently, um, how do you think that uh, we can kind of convince working class Americans that such a transition to green and renewable technology would be beneficial to them and would be uh, impactful to their lives in a meaningful way and that they could actually understand, um, you know, the importance of this transition? Well, I think most working people get it. Grassroots working people get it. Yeah. They don't want, you know, dirty pollution from the fossil fuel industry. They're worried about nuclear waste from nuclear power. Now, the institutions, the, uh, you know, some of the union tops, you know, they are more interested in the bird they got in their hand than the two in the bush, even though there are more jobs in doing this ecological transition. I mean, on my website, we have a detailed budget for an eco-socialist Green New Deal. It needs 38 million workers to make this transition over the next decade. And when we released it last fall, we said, the bottleneck is labor. It's not going to be capital or technology because we got the technology. We can raise the money. Where are we going to find the people to do the work? Now in this coronavirus depression, this is how we get out of it. Because investors are scared. Consumers are hoarding their money. And a lot of small businesses are already out of business and those jobs destroyed. Small business accounts for half of the jobs in this country. So that's the recipe for a long-term stagnation. The Green New Deal is what can get us out of it. So I think that argument can be made to working people. And, uh, you know, it was the oil, chemical, and atomic workers, three of the most toxic industries, that came up with the idea of a just transition back in the 80s. They called it back then the Superfund for Workers. We had an environmental super fund to clean up the environment when a corporation ran out of funds to do so. And they said, what about a, work, a super fund for workers? So they can make the transition from these dirty industries to clean industry. And so that's what we need as well. So that as we, you know, if somebody's working in a gas fired power plant or have been, you know, drilling for oil, you know, their wages and benefits are uh, sustained for up to five years through this just transition fund. But given that there's so much work to do right now in this energy transition, it won't be hard to train those people for new jobs in this transition. So, uh, I think if you want jobs, the Green New Deal is the way to go. It's going to create more jobs than, you know, certainly fracking the hell out of the country, which seems to be the policy of both major parties. Right. Uh, while we're on the topic of green energy, um, it seems one, of, one aspect of the burgeoning green uh, market that's proven itself to not only be uh, feasible uh, for transformation, but also massively profitable is the transportation sector. Um, should uh, what would your uh, how, would your administration support a transition to say something along the lines of a high speed rail or a ramped up train system to the likes of Europe? How do you imagine a green transition as far as transportation is concerned? Yeah, we want a national transportation corporation that deals with both the rails and the airlines and integrates them into a planned system that includes light rails within cities. The trolley systems this country had between the 1890s and 1930s. That's not rocket science. High-speed bullet trains like almost every other developed country has. And we got a decrepit Amtrak that even doesn't even have priority on the rails they use. The freight trains have the, the priority. And a lot of them are, you know, these oil trains and coal trains. And then uh, the freight rails. All this has to be electrified rails powered by clean solar and wind power. Um, and then, you know, high-speed rail, and then, yeah, freight rail. So that should be the backbone of our transportation system. Freight should come off the roads to a large extent and get on the rails. And then airlines should be integrated into that because airlines is one of the toughest areas to reduce the carbon footprint. It's only about 2% of the world's carbon footprint, but that was before the coronavirus. But... Um, it's hard to replace those fuels. You can do biofuels, but that kind of recycles the carbon. Um, so you want to reduce that. And the high-speed rails will reduce short and intermediate range travel. Yeah. You know, it's quicker to get on a train and go from New York to Washington than to go out to the airport, go through security, wait for your plane. They want you there two hours early yeah. and then wait for your baggage and, you know, and then commute back into the city. If you go from center city to center city on a train, you're going to get there a lot faster. 
Um, while we are on the topic of coronavirus, I'd, I'd love to ask you, in your view, uh, mm -hmm. the current administration's response, um, has that been adequate? Um, how would your uh, response to coronavirus uh, differ in, in Hawkins' presidency? I mean, I don't know how you could be more incompetent and callous than the, the Trump administration response. I mean, they, it's like they're trying to make a bad response. And, you know, Biden is kind of invisible on it. You know, they should have immediately used the Defense Production Act to ramp up the medical supplies that are needed by the hospitals. They should use it to get the testing, contact tracing, and isolating those infected up and running. Uh, because until that happens, we can't go back to work safely. Um, we need to get protective, personal protective equipment to workers. There should be OSHA standards that companies have to agree to uh, and enforce and uh, when people go back to work. Um, we need to protect people's, and, and I, I have a whole 11-point program I put out in a statement, but the idea is we need to protect people's jobs, incomes, homes, or housing, their access to health care. Medicare should just be covering the COVID treatment as well as the testing and emergency health care services in this environment. You know, if you get treated, it's like $35,000 on average and up to eighty-five, dollars $100,000 if you end up on a respirator. Yeah. And if you don't survive, that bill goes to your family. So that, you know, Medicare should cover. Right. And uh, so we protect, you know, what we should do is what they did in Europe. You know, we're, we're approaching 25, 30% unemployment. In Europe, they're like 5 or 6% because they paid companies to keep people on payroll, just sort of freeze the economy until it could reopen again. And we just basically, we had a payroll protection program for small business, but the big businesses grabbed the money, is incompetently uh, administered. Um, I still don't have my so-called stimulus check. I know there's a lot of us like that. I mean, it's total incompetence. And the other thing that I would say we need is we need universal mail-in ballot for November. Great. Otherwise, a lot of people are not going to be able to vote because everything the public health officials are telling us is, you know, this, this virus will still be around and we'll still be wearing masks when we go outside and social distancing. And a lot of people, because there's going to be a lot more sickness and death, are going to be reluctant to vote. So we don't want the vote suppressed. Yeah. Now, uh, Howie, uh, one more question for you here. Uh, as someone myself who voted uh, green in 2016 for Jill Stein and who uh, is really hoping that a third party can, you know, become a viable option going into the into the future, to you know, kind of break up the stranglehold that we're experiencing with the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I was personally excited by um, Jesse Ventura teasing a nomination or teasing a run for the Green Party. Now I'm aware he didn't formally go through the process, but uh, since Jill Stein ran twice and failed to get to 5% both times, uh, electorally, how do you think you can do better? And uh, would there be any possibility in the future of the Greens nominating uh, someone with more name recognition that could maybe more realistically win an election against, you know, two of the biggest names in American politics right now? You know, we did that with Ralph Nader, mm -hmm. who had a much better reputation with progressives than Jesse Ventura. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was attacked, you know, by the Democratic Party. Uh, in New York, we tried running celebrities. We got on one time with Grandpa Al Lewis, the old Grandpa Munster, and then we ran some people and then they didn't get it. Then they ran me, who had no name recognition, but we had a good message and we had organization, and three times we've got enough votes to get on the ballot in New York. So I, the lesson I draw from that is celebrities are no shortcut until we do the organizing. And that means not just mobilizing the people we already got, but going out and speaking to the people that's not voting, the 100 million people that's not going to vote in this presidential election, working class people, people of color, young people, because they're alienated. Some are apathetic, but most are just alienated. They don't like either party. They're disgusted with politics. They don't think the politicians know what their problems are, know who they are, and only see them, you know, maybe on TV ads, hardly ever in the neighborhood. So we got to build a party at the grassroots. And you don't do that by going out and preaching to people. You go out and listen. And you build relationships and friendships. And when we have party chapters in these communities where the people trust us, they know us, and they know that we got, you know, practical solutions or we can help them find them, that's when we're going to have the base where we can be the major party and force in American politics. There's no shortcut around that. So that's, you know, that's what I think about, you know, the celebrity solution is not a real solution. There's no shortcut to building a real grassroots political party. The Democrats and Republicans 
are not really parties. They're memberless. You don't go to your local Democratic or Republican Party chapter to figure out how to solve a problem in the community. You know, it's all coming at us from the top down. We're atomized, disorganized at the base. And they pre-select our choices. They call it the money primary before the voting primary. And And they tell us what our choices are. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to add that organization is something uh, you're definitely uh, really well acquainted with as a retired uh, teamster and construction worker and UPS worker. Uh, uh, Do you have anything to say about the state of labor unions in America and specifically about the attacks on the United States Postal Service by the Trump administration and the threat of privatization that threatens that industry? Yeah, we got to fight that. I mean, how the, mail, how the ballot's going to be mailed if they get, you know, they might run out of money sometimes in the summer and September. Right. And that's what, you know, Trump and those people want to do. They want to hand over all the delivery to private services that aren't obligated to deliver to rural areas, for example. Or in inner city neighborhoods like I'm in, they tried to close our post office down. I did a petition a few years ago, and I'll tell you, man, that thing got a few thousand signatures in a few days because people said, yeah. We need our post office. They already closed the other one on the other side of the neighborhood. So that's a huge, you know, asset, public asset that we cannot lose. Um, So you asked about the post office. What was the other part of your question? Oh, we just wanted to follow up and uh, say we want to be respectful of your time. I mean, I know we're we're pressing the limits of our our, uh, scheduled uh, interview, uh, but we just wanted to ask if uh, you were uh, elected president, what would your priorities be in the the first kind of 100 days to kind of solve some of these problems that we've, the defunding, the gutting of the public um, utilities, uh, the gutting of, uh, you know, uh, administ- uh, the, the, the Trump administration has done. Um, what would your response be to that in the first 100 days in office? What would your plan look like to recover? Well, the first day I repeal a lot of Trump's executive orders, particularly in the environmental field, but others, immigration and so forth. Um, and I would pardon a lot of the whistleblowers that were prosecuted under the Espionage Act. Uh, I would drop the charges against Julian Assange. I would see what I could do to get the fine hanging over the head of Chelsea Manning removed. Um, And I would invite Edward Snowden into my administration because I think he has a good handle on balancing the need for intelligence gathering and our privacy rights. And uh, so I think that's the first day. And then if we were elected, we'd have a mandate for the Green New Deal for nuclear disarmament initiatives, for an economic bill of rights. And I would go to Congress, you know, the first thing I do is we got to put together a budget and get the State of the Union address going. And I would go to Congress and say, look, we got a mandate. And, you know, get on board or you all, at least in the House, are going to face re-election in two years. And if you're not helping us, you know, we'll be running against you. And since the people spoke very clearly in this election, you know, you better pay attention. And then keep the people that got us in office organized, mobilized, so that we uh, can keep pushing forward. Absolutely. We thank you so much for your time. How can people support you? Well, go to my website, howiehawkins.us, and there you can find more information about what we're saying. You can sign up to get our bulletins. You can volunteer. You can donate. You can do everything. Howie Hawkins, Green Party uh, potential nominee. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Howie. Okay. Take care. Bye.